Hello, and welcome to our third out of four BFA gallery thesis talks. Um, tonight we have um, our, our, third, uh, our third talk and uh, featuring nine students. Um, the thesis exhibition is part of the BFA uh, degree, and um, we have 32 students in the whole graduating class. Um, tonight there'll be nine. Um, join us also Thursday night at five for the last of our talks. Um, and please feel free to uh, put any questions or comments in the chat and we'll try to address them as they arrive. Thank you and enjoy tonight's talks. All right, hi, thank you so much for coming to our group show. The world is big and I want to have a good look at it before it gets dark. We're gonna take it away with the first presenter. Hello, my name is Felicity Gunn. I am a senior um, getting my BFA in printmaking. I'm really excited to be kicking off the artist talks tonight um, with my thesis show titled Three Story Thumbprint. This work is a um, compilation of illustrations and etchings that I put together, um, kind of observations and research that um, I have gathered over the year of um, looking into man-made structures and um, natural landforms. The images that I will be sharing with you tonight are all locations in Athens, Ohio. Um, I've fallen in love with the environment around here as I've um, grown up here the past four years. So I'm really excited to share my work with you tonight. Um, all of these pieces are presented on handmade natural fiber paper, um, kind of furthering that connection between place and land and environment. So I will continue with a presentation that I have prepared of images of all of the pieces within the show tonight. So I will continue with that. Cool, okay. So I wanted to start the presentation just with some background on um, some of my sketches that I put together this summer. Um, this was kind of some early work, um, just studying the landscape around here in um, Southern Ohio. I found it really interesting how um, kind of architecture and landforms worked in harmony with each other. Um, and also how just different things like tree lines and um, grass growth and everything like that just really complements each other in this region. Um, so that was just a kind of a look at my early thoughts on, on this um, process and, and way of drawing too. Um, before I get to the pieces, I just want to discuss how I put together the paper. Um, so they are all of the paper, I made a total of six different ones throughout the year, um, made from natural fiber. Um, this is a collection of raw material that, um, for those of you who don't know, you collect and harvest the raw material. Um, so for example, for the squash vine, I grew the squash vine in my front yard this summer, harvested it, cut it into pieces, um, and then you cook it down and um, beat it and create paper pulp. And then um, from there, you can pull the sheets of paper. So that's just kind of a look at that process. And um, this is a list of all of the papers that I put together. Um, I was really impressed with the, the subtleties in it, and you'll kind of see how um, it works kind of in harmony with the um, line quality of the etchings and illustrations. This is the first piece that I want to share tonight. It's titled Just Down the Way. Um, this is my introduction to the process of etching, um, which is a printmaking process where you incise lines on a copper plate um, and then use acid to etch the lines deeper so that um, you, when you ink up the plate and um, print it, uh, it comes out looking like this. 
Um, so this piece was really, I, I chose this composition for the piece um, because I was drawn um, very strongly to the, um, to the, the reclamation of um, natural organic form from the plants, um, the plant life growing along the top of this, like along the sides of uh, this print. Um, so kind of furthering that connection of uh, place and land and um, its interaction with nature, kind of cliche man-made versus nature, looking at these rigid structures in uh, conversation with the organic forms. So um, for each of these pieces, I have detailed shots and then um, I have to finish each piece. I show what it looks like in the gallery. For those of you who aren't able to see it in person, I wanted you to get a sense of what it looks like um, set up and framed and everything. And then this is it in the gallery. The lighting is a little off, but I just wanted to share how um, I presented the work. I really wanted the paper to be just as in, like as much as important as the image itself. Um, so that was my goal with this framing style. This second piece is titled Absent Gaze Onward. It's an illustration on sunflower stock paper. Um, so kind of thinking about um, the idea that that domestic place and home has kind of shifted for us a lot um, over this time during COVID. Um, I brought in the new year with COVID, so I spent the first 10 days of January stuck inside my bedroom looking out my window, and this was the view that I got to see. So I felt very obligated to um, draw and put it together in this in this way. Um, and I felt after after completing the drawing, um, I felt a weird uh, kind of emotional relationship with this telephone pole in the middle here, um, thinking about connection um, and specifically phys physical connection with the way the wires kind of come from the sides of the poles and um, kind of reach out of the frame. I'm thinking during the time, especially when I have COVID and just in general, how dependent I am on my phone for those kinds of connections. Um, so I see a lot of myself and in that kind of physical sense with this um, telephone pole. Um, and I was also having a lot of interesting conversations with grad students about this piece and going back to that connection of place and land and um, structure. Um, a grad student brought up to me the fact that um, the tree um, in this piece is can be related to the telephone pole. Um, with the telephone pole, the, the wires reaching out are like branches. Um, in a man-made form and the, the trunk of the tree is um, the pole of the telephone pole and which was originally literally a tree trunk. So um, I thought that was a really exciting conversation to have. And although I didn't think about it when I was putting the piece together, um, I was happy to have that conversation and make those realizations following. Um, so moving on from here, got some detailed shots of that. And that is the piece in the gallery. So you can kind of see how it looks framed and everything. The paper itself is pretty thin, so you can see it's got, it's warped and um, kind of got exposed edges. And I was really drawn to that quality of um, each of the papers. For this piece um, titled Home Again, this was um, an illustration on squash vine and abaca. Um, this piece for me was a direct connection between place and um, environment um, through the use of the squash vine paper. As I mentioned, I grew the squash in my front garden here. Um, my house is on the left um, in Athens, so I really wanted to push that, um, that physical connection and through image. Um, and then carrying on the motif of um, telephone wires and um, reaching beyond the, the frame of, of the piece itself. So just thinking about, I think with this specific location, I was really drawn to the fact that like the streets, the streets in Athens are tiered on hills in this way. Um, and I found that really interesting. And the streets beyond this are even, they, they tier even more so. The streets behind my house goes up a hill and then the, the street behind that street goes up. And, so I was really interested in that connection and how the architecture is almost forced to kind of work off of those different landforms for that. And here are some detailed shots of this piece.
and then that piece framed. And you can see the, the paper is a, a bit brown here as well. Um, the, the interesting quality of this natural fiber paper is that it tends to, um, the, the color kind of uh, fades out um, a little bit. So when it's exposed to light, the, the green from the squash isn't as uh, present the, the longer it's exposed to light. So that's just kind of a really interesting um, thing to watch happen as I put these together. So this is another etching, um, it's titled Up the Hill. Um, it's an etching on daylily paper. And with this piece, I think it specifically is connected to, like the last one, the place and environment and nature. Um, it's site specific. So this paper was made from daylilies that my professor um, very genu genuinely, generously, sorry, uh, gifted me. And, um, so I wanted to depict her uh, her house and her domestic place um, to pair with the paper. Um, I so I chose this composition, and I was really interested in how um, how the the natural um, the natural growth of the trees and plants around the house kind of surrounded it and balanced everything out. And you, it's paired with that that rigid structure um, that's man made, and um, just kind of looking at line versus form and. So that was, uh, that's kind of why I went this direction with the piece. And I just really like how the um, natural fiber paper comes through to and like interacts with the image itself. And that is the piece framed. And finally, I have um, a series of etchings titled Alley Wandering. Um, in this piece, um, I was kind of pulling back on, uh, going back to my original uh, kind of start to all of this, which was a um, drawing that I completed in a class um, last spring semester. And it was of an alleyway where I used to live. And it was kind of my first experience depicting anything like this um, with, in this way with architecture and land um, and kind of highlighted the haphazardness of college rentals um, conveniently shoved together with um, telephone wires and tree lines and everything. So, um, so I wanted to kind of go back to that. Um, and I presented this for this slideshow, it's on Kozo paper. Um, but in the show, you'll see that I decided to break them apart a little bit and they're actually printed on corn husk paper. So there's a slightly different interaction between the image and, and the paper. So um, just keep that in mind. And there it is in its frame. And that is all I have for you tonight. I just wanna say thank you so much to all of my um, professors and parents and just friends and peers and everyone. I could not have made it this far without all of your love and support. So just know that I, I'm just so excited with moving forward and thank you so much. So I'm gonna move it on to the next presenter. Hello, my name is Stephanie Schreiner. I'm a double major in graphic design and photo and integrated media. This is my photo thesis um, consisting of photos printed on metal and it's called Shedding Light. Because of the difficulty in seeing my final images in the gallery, I'll show them at the end. I'll start by showing a variety of images taken during the process of this project 
before they got narrowed down. I chose to print on metal versus paper because it shows depth, contrast, and shows true to colors. This project had a couple of inspirations. First was that when you search Hawking Hills, you see the same few pictures. I wanted to show that there's much more to see, not only the main views, but in the corners of each park. To make sure I captured this, I went to the areas where the crowds were. The second as was, as, was as I photographed, I constantly thought of how I always came here with my family, a specific day always comes to mind. The whole family is at Ash Cave, and like all kids, I wanted to play in the water. And just like all parents, they didn't want their car wet. So my grandparents offered to take me home. The car ride was a bit cold. Not only do I think of that moment, but I always picture a photo of me and my grandpa on his back as we pretended to hold up a fallen tree. These images are to invite you to explore everything a place has to offer, to take those important to you, to take pictures, and enjoy your time. No matter the different phases I've went through, I've always visited these parks. Thank you to those watching and coming in to view the gallery. And on to our next presenter. I am Dr. Mirror. Uh, this is I am a uh, EFA student in sculpture and expanded practice, and this is my work titled Plant Bill, Plant Form, and Amalgamation. Uh, it is comprised of a series of amalgamated objects. Uh, they are comprised of synthetic and natural materials, as well as dye concoctions to, to disguise uh, material solids. I'll now go to my presentation to show some detailed images and share some poetic sound with the pieces of the visible. So my work begins from a place of wonder. Uh, what is and what will become of our landscapes and the detritus that we discard? Uh, the approach that I take is non-didactic, non-didactic, uh, rather poetics and the abstract represent my own perceptions of a growing estrangement from the natural world. Uh, as we and I collectively encroach upon the ever smaller pockets of pre-industrial life, uh, the materials and form act as stand-ins for various forces present, found and uh, collected detritus, such as steel or consumer goods, are indicative of the spread of human processes, um, while textures and natural inclusions feel the squeeze and pressures of narrowing spaces between great forces, both natural and human instigated. Um, there's an acknowledgement of my beneficiary status uh, in this environment, and it's uh, pertinent to the work. Um, participating in the creep of human impact on the environment while also being cognizant of the destruction that it causes. The work is rendered as amalgamate sculptural forms, analogous to landfill fossils, geological mystics, or earthen concoctions employing synthetic material and dyes, as well as collected and forged natural elements and dyes, furthering the acknowledgement of an inevitable shift in our landscapes. 
This is present through a visual fascination and sublimity, as well as imposition and precariousness. Not all of the details in the show were captured in this presentation. So if you're able, come view my work and the other amazingly talented artists in the show at Ohio University Art Gallery. And thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk. And I will now lead you on to our next presenter. When I started to paint this desk, I intended for it to be completely water themed, but suddenly cherry trees happened, and then more trees, and now it's trees and water. And that pretty much sums up my experience with this project. My original idea is something I never intended to mix in, and it works well. Hi, I'm Adam Pike, painting and drawing. Let me explain. Honestly, for my thesis project, I wanted to replicate my favorite painting that I've ever made, um, a fictional sea creature in space, but, you know, make it professional. How would I do that? With real sea creatures, endangered real sea creatures. That's what a real professional artist would do. I made two paintings very slowly and didn't have much fun. Despite that, I still love these pieces and have them both hanging on my wall. Why did I only make two paintings in 15 weeks? Procrastination. I did learn some valuable lessons though, like mix more of that specific shade of paint than you think you need. I did not learn how to not procrastinate. This semester, my medium changed to digital drawings. I borrowed a fancy drawing tablet from the School of Art. It's a delight to use. I completed one drawing. And then I started on another, and then procrastination. One weekend I procrastinated by playing Minecraft, a building adventure video game, and my professor encouraged me to use Minecraft in my thesis. I started streaming on Twitch, a live streaming platform for everything from art to gaming to just chatting to music. I started in survival mode, where I have to gather all of my own resources and have to fight off enemies. Um, I, I built three whale sharks, a house with a basement, and most of a jellyfish before realizing I could be having even more fun. So I switched to creative mode, which gives me unlimited resources, flight, and invulnerability. Things went a lot smoother, and I built three more giant jellyfish and a couple of turtles. I decided to build some things off stream to keep them as a surprise for the lucky, lucky people to get to come into the gallery and see them for themselves. When they, when they get to play the world for by themselves. When they get to play through the world for themselves. My favorite stream was the one where I built seahorses. I hadn't been so sure about including them, but thought, hey, I'll build one and see how I feel about it. And I ended up having the most fun with them. I had an active person in my chat, and I can't tell you how satisfying that is to have someone interacting with you. I also built some axolotls. One corner of the map looked extremely empty, or looking a little bare, so I decided to fill it with polar bears, a creature that's already in the game. Um, one problem in that corner was a dense forest, not a snow biome, and as we all know, polar bears live in snow biomes. So I burnt down the forest and filled it with snow and ice and polar bears. I took the recordings of my eight streams and edited them down into about five fast-forwarded minutes each.
but my time goal for the final video was 10 minutes. I'm an artist, not a mathematician, you'll figure it out. So I edited them again, and again, and again. I learned this semester not only how to live stream myself playing games for the whole world to see, I also found some fun facts out about my chosen endangered creatures. Axolotls can regrow limbs, tails, organs, even parts of the eye and brain. Kemp's Ridley sea turtles' hatchling sex is determined by temperature during incubation. If the temperature stays below 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the hatchlings will be mostly male. Nismus sea horses have been found in only three water habitats on the south coast of South Africa. Groups of peach blossom jellyfish, called smacks, are often all male or all female, making sexual reproduction rare. Whale sharks giving birth have never been observed. I did not learn how to not procrastinate. I will now turn you over to our next presenter. Hello, I'm Hannah Arthur. Um, for the people that aren't able to be in the studio today, I'd like to show you an up-close view of my piece. I, I thought I'd slowly scroll through it um, while stopping occasionally while so you can get um, a view of the detail. I'm also just gonna talk as I go through it about some of my inspirations, my motives behind it, essentially. So as an individual, I've always been drawn to learning about every working aspect of the natural world, because the more I learn, the more I understand my place as a human, an animal, an organism, a part of a larger system. Culturally, I find that there's a lack of this deeper understanding and respect for the earth around us that results in a disconnection from the real world. A disconnect ultimately causing devastation to our creator planet, fellow organisms, and our species itself and my own connection with contemporary society. Our society as it stands has no survival instinct. We plan to capitalize our planet to the point of no return. It's said that the world is your oyster, something to be liquidated for its capital, for the individual gain. As I watch how the earth is treated, I can't help but carry the pain around myself. And here I've digitally in illustrated a small local corner of Raccoon Creek specifically Little Raccoon Creek, which is one of its largest tributaries. And as of current, the creek is in a state of extreme pollution. Um, historically, it's been completely liquidated for every natural resource, specifically coal and iron. Um, and in a way, my piece acts as a tribute to the familiar forms of life that once were and should be again. Um, and lastly, I'd like to ask that you support the movement to stop Line 3, which is the effort to stop a transcontinental pipeline expansion by Enbridge. It would be one of the largest crude oil pipelines in the world. Um, it runs through Canada to Minnesota. Um, transports tar sands, which is worse than conventional oil, and we do not have to know how to clean it up. So a very important movement very important to me to plug this. Um, thank you so much. Now we'll move on to the next person. And this is my uh, senior thesis project titled Phoenix Pinecone. And before I go into some more images, I want to share with you uh, my inspiration. The 
This is uh, an early work of mine from probably summer camp one time. It's a pine cone with googly eyes and feathers glued to it. Um, and I found this in my childhood bedroom one time when sprucing up. And I thought, like, oh, that's kind of cute. Kind of, it's kind of like a little, a little pine cone phoenix because of the colors and feathers glued to it. And then I kept thinking about that idea and how similar pine cones and phoenixes are, and that eventually developed into what you see now. So I'm going to go ahead and get some more images pulled up so you can see all the details. All right, so the natural phenomenon that to me reminds me of the phoenix is um, called serotony, and it is an environmental trigger that lets um, seeds, in this case specifically pine cones, know when it is safe to release their seeds. So instead of doing it spontaneously when the seeds are mature, it waits for an environmental trigger, in this case, fire. And the types of pine cones that I more or less modeled mine after are logical pine, table mountain pine, bishop pine and pitch pine, and all of those are different pine trees in different regions of the United States where forest fires are common, basically. They would roll through every 50 to 150 years, and so the forest basically adapted to benefit from this. So the pine cones will stay sealed up really tight on the branches for decades until a fire rolls through the area, and then they spring open, releasing their seeds, and at this point, it's perfect conditions for new saplings to grow. There is no competition from the underbrush, so no small bushes and shrubs competing for sunlight or space. Additionally, the soil after a fire is so nutrient rich due to the ash and the recent fire that super good for all those little baby pine trees. <laughs> so this, because of its connection to fire and rebirth, reminds me of the phoenix. <laughs> and I like to think everyone's pretty familiar with the phoenix, particularly my generation. I think we all pretty much know <clears throat> that phoenixes burst into flame when it is time for them to die and are reborn from the ashes because Albus Dumbledore told us that in the second Harry Potter book. <laughs> um, it's not just a, a phenomenon nowadays, but the phoenix has been a very recognizable symbol since ancient times. Some of the earliest descriptions of the phoenix come from Greek writer Herodotus, he described coloring as red and gold, which is why I've included red and gold luster to add a little sparkle. Um, and also the Romans were interested in the phoenix. Roman writer Pliny the Elder noted that the phoenix has a crest of feathers on the back of his head, very iconic crest of feathers that is seen in almost all phoenix imagery I've ever looked at, and also relates back to the earliest phoenix-like bird, the Egyptian Bennu, which was always depicted with two long crest feathers. That was kind of a precursor to what we call a phoenix today. Also, um, Roman poet Claudian had a very large poem about the phoenix, and he used it as a hopeful symbol for the empire to rise again, the Roman Empire. The phoenix has been used as a symbol for many different things, from a symbol of Christ's resurrection to a symbol of uniqueness for a lot of different monarchs, European monarchs. Um, but in most of those different symbolisms, all the descriptions kind of relate the phoenix to a couple of different birds. Mainly, I've seen swan, eagle, and peacock referred to as being similar in body to the phoenix. So I modeled mine after roughly parts of it after those types of birds, but also mine is modeled after a pine cone. <laughs> That's a little, my little spin on it. So, because of the connection of phoenixes and pine cones to fire, the perfect material for this was ceramic, not only because I already work in ceramic and I'm very comfortable with it, but because clay is only clay until it is fired to high temperatures and becomes ceramic, a material that can no longer be reshaped and reformed. And this clay that I used was fired to over 2300 degrees Fahrenheit, so it gets pretty hot, but <laughs> I really enjoy the firing process. Um, I've always been fascinated with bonfires as a kid, so it's just like the grown-up version for me to fire a kiln. Really enjoyed that. Also, the clay that I've used, um, I picked this clay not only because I enjoyed the type of firing it is, but because of the color. So much of this piece, the phoenix body and also all of the pine cone parts, 
are raw clay. I chose not to put any glaze on them or much surface treatment so you could really see the texture and color of just the natural clay after it's been fired. So originally my plan was to have five, it was very different, it was to have um, five larger sculptures kind of depicting stages of the phoenix's life paralleled with the stages of a pine cone opening. So it was going to be like a phoenix on a branch with a closed pine cone and then phoenix like starting to die and then on fire with the pine cone slowly opening next to it and then ashes and then a baby chick phoenix with a sapling pine tree next to it. But those, every time I sketch it out or even tried to build it in clay, I always felt disconnected. It was always confusing whether the phoenix or the pine cone was more important and I wanted them to be the same. So I decided to make them the same, one in the same. So my phoenix is a pine cone. I constructed its body out of what I call pine cone, quote, feathers, end quote. Um, and this created a lovely texture, in my opinion, that really emulates pine cone while you still get bird and feather textures. I did this from the wings all the way down to the tail. And yeah, all, throughout my entire playing process, I always wanted multiple pedestals and I always wanted them set up in a semicircle pattern because to me it was important to make a nod to the cyclical nature of the pine cone and the phoenix that the forest will burn but new forests will grow, the phoenix will die but a new one will rise. Um, so that was very important to me to get across in my installation. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble on about my project I've worked on for a whole year. And now we are going to move on to our next presenter. Hi, hello everybody. My name is Charles Bondenhubel. I am a senior here at Ohio University, and this is my BFA thesis exhibition called Self-Sustained. And it is a taken glimpse of the edible plants that surround us in our urban environments. And I will now show you a detailed slideshow presentation. So I basically started out this year and I knew I wanted to do uh, my thesis based on nature because I've always been immersed with it ever since I was a kid. Me and the family would all, we live just five miles away from a local national park and so we would camp there all the time and my grandfather would show us like, he would take us through the woods, show us all the plants and things and like, don't touch this one because it'll hurt you or like, this one's fine so you can touch this one. So it was always a nice, experience. And then at the beginning of quarantine, um, uh, my inspiration came from when I downloaded TikTok, silly enough. I found a, a, a TikToker named Alexis Nicole, who was a forager, and she, her, her videos inspired me to do this presentation. So I took, so I researched plants that she had said and done my own research too, to then bring you this, that what you were seeing. So I first started out by doing oil paintings. And then I also mixed together oil and charcoal drawing because I wanted to incorporate my painting and drawing aspects that I've been studying these past four years. So here on the left, you have the dandelion. And in the middle, you have the wood sorrow. And then on the far right, you have the chicory. And all three of these plants are edible. All of them, the entire plant is flower, leaves, to the stem. Um, and then so I was doing these and then I kind of hit a lull and I didn't really want to paint them anymore. And then I started taking a printmaking class and then, so this class re-inspired me, it reignited the flame of wanting to create art. And so that is what brought me to my final installation here of print that it is an etching that I did on plexiglass. And then I rolled it through a I think it is called a French tool, so it's like a very big wheel and press, and you just you roll it through, and then it magically shows up. So it's really cool. And so this here is the dandelion. Um, it's one of the most iconic weeds, I would say, that everybody knows. You know, 
bright yellow flowers, you make wishes with their seeds when you're younger and when you're like all ages, they're a fun plant to look at and everything like that. So like I said, you can eat everything on it. The roots can be dried and made into a tea or a coffee. The leaves can be made into a salad and the flowers can actually be fermented into a wine if you so choose. Or even fried like little chicken nuggets, but like vegetarian. And then here we have the chicory and it is most known for um, its root substitute to be coffee. So you go collect it, dry it out in your oven or dehydrate it, whatever you choose. And then, you know, you grind it up like coffee and then you brew it. And the most distinguishing factor is like the, the flowers are beautiful lilac. They're soft and pale purple. Um, and then the leaves also can be put into a salad or into like a wild pesto, if you will. And um, it is actually related to the dandelion. They're like the same kind of family. And you can tell by the leaves, the same shape and everything. So it's really cool. And then here we have the broadleaf plantain. And I always saw this one when I was younger. I'm like, always thought, what is this? This is like cool to look at because the seeds, when they're dry on the plant, you could just like rub them off and then they would just fall. And it was like fun to like throw around and everything. And it turns out the seeds, if once you dry them and you add hot water to them and let them rest for a little bit, they turn into a gelatinous type of goo and it is actually used for um, like a vegan egg replacement if you like in dishes that you want or as a thickener in soups and stews. Um, so the roots, the leaves and the seeds on this are all edible. Everything is edible on all the plants anyway. And then here is the wood sorrel. Um, it's a cute little creeper plant. By that I mean it, it's, it grows across the ground and runs, kind of like a strawberry does. And um, it has like a very zesty, lemony, citrus kind of flavor because of oxalic acid in it. And so it, it's kind of like bitter and everything, and it um, adds a very nice depth to a salad, like as a little garnish, you throw the flowers on it, throw the, throw the, um, the leaves, like little clover petals, just like a cute little garnish. And um, it just adds that. And then you can also, I looked into it, and you can make a gazpacho, which is like a nice cold soup. And that's and it would be very nice on like a hot summer day. You're walking, you're going home after a long day at work. Just pick some of this, go inside, cook it up, and make a cold soup, and then relax for the rest of the night. And then here we have the dead nettle. And don't let the name scare you because it's dead and nettle. And so it's kind of not you wouldn't think that it would be edible because <laughs> because of the name, it's so sinister. But it just means that like it's uh, the nettles are like dead so they won't sting you if you eat them unless uh, compared to the stinging nettle where they're sharp and they will stab you as we all know it's painful but with this one you can eat them all again and then you can make a nice beautiful pesto with these and then you can blend it up with the broadleaf plantain and make a wild spring mix and the flowers are cute little purple flowers and you can just see this growing anywhere and everywhere cracks in the road everything like that and then here we have the whole thing um, on display in the gallery, just as you can see, you can see it all in its totality. And I just want to thank everybody so much for coming and witnessing the show. And I'll move you on to our next presenter. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emma Fisher. I am a painting and drawing and photography and integrated media major. My thesis is titled, If You Walk Through the Garden. And as you can see, the first part of the show is this collection of prints, many of my favorite images from the work behind me. But the main part of the show is my book, handmade by myself. Every part of it was handmade from the binding to the cyanotyped cover. 
And before I get into my PowerPoint, I wanted to hold this open so I could show you guys some of my favorite spreads. Is this good? Okay. Break the fourth wall a little. All right, and now I'll get into some detail shots. So in this body of work, I am engaging with the experience of nature and its connection to the human psyche. My goal was to create an environment or realm or universe that my viewer could explore. I want people to feel impassioned by these moments I depict in my work, and I hope that they bring some form of healing or comfort. My goal with the body of work was to create an immersive universe filled with beauty and wonder that felt untouched by man. I am personally disturbed by the statistic that across the continental United States, we are never more than a hundred miles or so from a McDonald's, and in turn, it makes my heart ache for the dwindling old growth forest that used to be in such abundance. I greatly appreciate my solitude personally, and I often find myself fantasizing about traveling back in time to live in some unprocessed, uncivilized world where I could be enveloped by nature. So the decision to turn this project into a book in the first place was because I wanted to be able to implement a very loose metaphorical narrative, and I wanted to be able to dictate how the viewer navigated through the work so that this metaphorical narrative could build and swell as you flip through the pages. I also really appreciate the physicality of the book, how you can hold it in your hands like a precious package. It's hand-bound using the Coptic method of binding, and it was important to me for it to be handmade, as it makes it feel all the more precious and unique. It was also important for my images to be in spreads like you saw, so that they could have a dialogue with one another, play off of one another with each other more effectively than prints on a wall can. So many of my images were digitally manipulated, cropped, or shot in a very tight, specific way so that no man-made structures would be present. These are the first two images in the book. The black and white is the very first one. Uh, this image originally had some brick building peeking through the right and left top corners, which I painted out and replaced with overgrowth and leaves. Not only is it incredibly distracting to see little bits of brick in the background, but I also felt that these details completely take the viewer out of the realm I'm trying to put them in. Both of these images were shot in Athens, just outside of Siegfried, the art building, in this big hill of kudzu. So I wanted to try to take out as much context or distractions as possible so that these images could feel much more far away and fantastical. I especially wanted to create images that had little context so that they struck the viewer more ambiguously. This image in particular is an overhead shot of a sand dune covered in mottled blue shadow and was intended to be easily mistaken as an aerial shot of a snowy mountain or river basin or something at first glance. The grass that once existed in the top left-hand corner of the image was painted out similar to the previous images and replaced with more sand so the image felt like a more immersive world. There are three images in the book total that feature a man-made object or a human figure. These two images in particular depict statues and one portrays a living person. These, especially the statues, are meant to be anchor points in the work. They were included for their connection to the past and their connection to a very old tradition of human artistry. In this work, the statues exist as a reminder of ancestry, a trigger for memory of people and of family. So my work features a number of cyanotypes and Van Dyke brown prints, and these are important, especially in the connection to memory. They exist to play on and echo the other images in the work. Compared to the full color, often digital images that take up most of the rest of the book, 
the Van Dyke Browns feel old and weathered and flat, and it's almost impossible not to associate them with 20th century sepia-tinted photography. For the cyanotypes, uh, I think there's a really special magic in the process of a recognizable three-dimensional object being flattened out to a two-dimensional reflection of itself. The real intrigue with these lies within all those little lines and details that are shown off so effectively within its two-dimensional form. So one of the most important things I learned through the making of this project is that we don't always know why we want to make the things we make until we've finished making them. At the start of the project, my goal was to talk much more about science and biology and how nature affects the human psyche, which is obviously still a huge part of the project. But as I continued to work, I realized that this project was much more personal to me than I had first imagined. And I learned how important it is for me to carve out space for myself to make the world I experience whatever I want it to be. As I mentioned before, many of these images were manipulated digitally, so many of the spaces or things featured in my project don't exist in real life the way they exist in my images. In that way, I ended up creating a universe for myself that is attuned to exactly my desires, and I found great joy and comfort in that process. And you know, now that I'm at the end of this whole process, the whole project, I realize that that's really what I want the takeaway of my viewer to be, that I want them to find joy and comfort in exploring this universe that I've essentially curated for myself. So that is the end of my presentation. I just wanted to thank all of my professors, my family members who have helped me so much along the years. And we'll move on to our next presenter. Hi, my name is Julia Kiss. I am a BFA in print making, and this is my show titled Subtleties. Um, I think I can speak for a lot of us when I say that this past year has been quite lonely. Um, this whole pandemic, I've been living alone for the first time. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I was going on a lot of walks. At first, just to have something to fill up the time, but I ended up connecting with nature in a way that I had never really before. Um, I find myself stopping to take a picture or something that caught my eye or stopping to pick up an interesting leaf or a fern or just anything that caught my attention. And at the time, I didn't really know what I'd make of these or if I'd even make any, anything of these. But as I kind of reflected back, I noticed there were some parallels between the things that I was drawn to and my mental state at the time. So I'm going to pull up some pictures so I can talk a little bit more in depth. All right, so this first piece is the first piece I made this whole entire year. Um, and this one is kind of more of what I was drawn to on if I was having a bad day. I'd be drawn to these chaotic overgrowths of foliage and leaves. Um, and this is kind of a good example of a piece that developed a new, I developed a new understanding of after I made it, and I didn't really realize exactly what it meant to me at the time. Because at the time it was really just, I saw it as more just echoing the chaos of my life at the time, but now the gold leaf lining is kind of reminding me of the good that could still be present during these times. Um, and this one is an example, kind of just, again, just little things that would catch my eye and just the little details that I would stop to look at. And um, this one, this quilt, it is a four and a half by five and a half feet quilt. Um, and this, on my street, there's a lot of English writing 
which is an invasive species. And I was thinking a lot about how it will do anything and it can grow anywhere to survive, even if it means harming its other surroundings, which it often does. And it kind of reminded me of the way I was feeling at the time, which is kind of like a one step forward, two step back kind of way. Um, and yeah, I also included cyanotypes in here. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had done a cyanotype installation and I was just really drawn to the colors and kind of what our last presenter, Emma, said, just the ways that you can take something three dimensional and have, you can pick up so many things in it. Um, and then the other part of this quilt has CMYK prints, except a lot of them are not, do not have all four layers of the CMYK. Um, the one I have on the screen on the left here only has cyan and magenta, whereas the one on the right has the rest of them. Um, I just kind of wanted to mess with the colors a little bit just to draw more attention to certain details in there. Um, and this isn't just another example of some of the colors, color differences. And yeah, going back to that, just again, all these pictures were taken on my street and just, it was just me trying to slow down and pay attention to things that I normally wanted. Um, and just focusing on these more intimate parts of nature just have reminded me to slow down and not always stress out so much about the big things in my own life. And so my show of subtleties is a dire direct reflection of how I spent my last year. And in a way, it kind of became a visual diary or a timeline of my mental state throughout. And we're going. Thank you so much for sticking around and uh, listening to all these wonderful presentations. We're so proud of everyone and tune in on Thursday for our last and final um, BFA gallery talks, um, Thursday at five. Thanks, see you then.